You are now rocking with Alia Surprise. Welcome to Chicago 52 Radio. A green party. You are now rocking with Alia Surprise. You are invited to the party and ask to be. Welcome to Chicago 52 Radio. A green party. Where you are invited to the party. from insurance fraud to uh, all types of different cases. And I'm going to let him introduce himself and talk more about that. Don, welcome to the show. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us uh, to be a part of Chicago 52 Collective Sessions. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. That's good. That's good. So today our topic is police reform. Of, it was brought to all of our attention over the holidays of an incident in, in Ohio where an unarmed black man was shot and killed by a police officer. Uh, this is an incident that is happening way too often than not. It seems as if the frequency has yet to yield and it is a topic that we should continue to address and discuss until there is a proper reform um, a remedy for it. So, um, Don Williams, I, do you have an insight? What's your view um, on what happened? Do you believe the police in that particular incident uh, was trained properly? Well, I don't have, I don't have a lot of uh, knowledge of that specific case at this point in time, but I think that uh, one of the things that that I think really helps with policing is is body cams, and I think they should be mandatory. Uh, and here in South Florida, uh, I, I practice pr predominantly in the Fort Lauderdale area, and the, the all the police agencies here have the Axion body cam, and I and I think that has uh, done a lot to uh, address the problem, curb the problem of police brutality because. Uh, if if it's all on if it's all on tape, it's hard to refute it. What happened? And uh, I know here, uh, the local prosecutor's office they won't file a resisting arrest charge unless there's a body cam of the incident, because that that was an, a go-to charge by the police for a long time. Uh, oh well, he re resisted, and uh, as a result of the resisting, we we found this drug on him, and we did this, we did that. They won't even approach it uh, without a body cam now. That's interesting. Uh, so in regards to the body cam, I believe in that case, he turned it on after he shot the, uh, the unarmed man, but they were able to recoup the footage because of a relay. <laughs> How is that possible? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry, John. Go ahead. Uh, again, it, it, the camera is no good if you don't turn it on. And uh, uh, they should be, as soon as that car stops, before you get out of the car, you just go on the vest and you turn the camera on. So it, it should be, it should be uh, it just second nature, becomes second nature of the police officer. You've, you've called in the, uh, the stopping of the car. You've got the car, and most, and most cars have uh, uh, cameras in the car. And you keep that camera running, and as soon as you get out, as you're getting out of that car, you just turn it on. David, you said that you were putting, um, creating a podcast, and you were studying um, police brutality and reform. Are there any questions that you would like to ask? Uh, Mr. Williams. Well, yeah, absolutely. Hello, and uh, Don, thanks for joining us today. It's, it's great to have you here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing, uh, just as an extension of my radio show, I'm doing a series of podcasts, hopefully starting in January, late January, um, on policing in America, starting with the origins of policing in America up to now and all the, the issues going on. Um, <clears throat> so I guess the, the, the $64,000 question is, do you 
believe, uh, with your experience in law and then just in life in general, <clears throat> do you believe that that systemic racism is a thing amongst policing in America? Systemic, not just sporadic, isolated, uh, an occasional racist here or there. Do you really believe it's embedded in the system one way or another? I think it's embedded in a lot of the system, in a lot of the police departments. And it seems like the smaller the police department, probably the greater that it is. Uh, and, uh, and, it has, and it has to change. And until it does, we're, we're gonna continue to see uh, incidents like this. Uh, the, the, pro the larger police departments, I, um, I think it, it, here, I'm just recalling from my experience in South Florida, uh, the larger the police department, the more diverse the police department is. And I think it's, they're having a better uh, chance of dealing with, with racism, but you get these uh, small police departments in these small towns. And it, it seems like you're all seeing <clears throat> these incidents involving these small police departments. Okay. But so what might follow from what you just said is that in the bigger cities like Minneapolis or Chicago, New York, New York, so on, that there's less likely to be a systemic racist issue going on. But that's where you're finding the majority of these issues occurring is in the bigger metropolises, metro metropolis areas. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I, well, I think a lot of it too is because of, uh, you've got cameras in these bigger departments. And so you're, you're flushing out these, uh, these guys. Uh, some of these small departments, if they don't have cameras, you, you know, you have a tough time flushing it out. It, uh, the, uh, George Floyd uh, incident with all the uh, with all the cameras was uh, when I saw that or originally I, I you know I'm saying how does this guy get from point A to point B and and everything and he's handcuffed and he's supposedly resisting it's 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 nonsense. Okay, and what what do you say to the suppression of evidence once it is received on camera? Sometimes there are incidences such as the recent one we've had in Chicago, where we later learned that the mayor of Chicago herself um, suppressed some evidence coming to light, which was on footage. Uh, do you foresee that as being a, a difficulty when utilizing body cameras? Does it become a more lengthy process of law and litigation that then arises? Well, I they shouldn't be suppressing anything. If it's on the camera, it should come out and just, you know, let the truth come out. Uh, there shouldn't be any withholding of, of body cam uh, evidence. And I, and I, and I strongly disagree, uh, uh, disagree with that. If that's the mayor's position that she took in that case, you shouldn't be suppressing this stuff. I mean, if it happened, if it happened, let the chips fall with you. Okay, the other question a lot of people have uh, when it comes to camera and utilizing cameras is the cost. Um, you know, on the one side, we have the defunding, the police movement. On the other side, we have people that are uh, want to question the police brutality cases and have, you know, strong footage of what is going on. Uh, because, of, because of the high media spending rises as a result. So, so what do you say to that and, and the cost? Is it justifiable? Uh, first of all, I don't believe in defunding the police. We need, we need police protection, but the, they should be, the cameras cost around $700 per officer. And that's, it sounds like a lot at first, but when you talk about all the costs you're gonna save in litigation costs and in, in, uh, in, in other costs, it's, it's peanuts. I mean, for, for 700, uh, I think those uh, Axiom cameras cost around $700 a piece. And they probably sell them in bulk for less than that. And the bottom line is get everybody equipped. Get everybody equipped and get everybody using them. And then you're gonna, you know, and then you're gonna have a better idea uh, of what happened on the street. I know uh, here locally, we, uh, it's been years ago, they, they won't even take a confession. The state attorney's office won't even take a confession from a defendant and, and use it in evidence if it's not video audio recording. They don't want just an audio recording. They want an audio video recording.
things. So, uh, and that way, not only do you, you see and hear exactly what, what transpired in that uh, interview room, and it should be the same on the road. You should be able to see and hear exactly what transpired. Okay. Did you find that it, it's easier for juries and, and people that are, you know, watching footage to make a decision as a result? Oh. Is it easier for them to visualize at all? Do they, have you seen a, a difference in the statistics on, on that? Uh, I'm not familiar with the statistics, but I know that video I hate seeing video sometimes because the video is tells it like it is. Yeah, that's and, true. Uh, you know, uh, most of my cases in the last uh, 15 years have been uh, first degree murder cases. So I'm dealing with very serious cases. Most of them are death, death penalty cases. And uh, when you have video, it, whether it's private video or a police video, it's, it's, uh, it's it's tough to deal with. I, I, I'm defending a case right now where the uh, there was a it's a home invasion and the homeowner had uh, du had videos cameras in his house and unfortunately you get to see my client from two different angles pick a gun up and shoot the homeowner. So there's no question as to what happened. I mean you've got a uh, you've got a uh, a video. Uh, a video it doesn't have audio but the bottom line is you have video of exactly what happens so uh, video evidence can either hurt you or or, or help you mm. true because I, th I think when we deal with a lot of uh, criminal law it, it's not you know it's on a beyond reasonable doubt scale that we're working with which right. can make it difficult and then we have the actus reus and then the mens rea, which is, you know, the actual uh, commission of the act and the mental elements. So I guess it, it helps in some way when it comes to uh, viewing whether or not the act occurred. As for the mental element, I mean, that, 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 that's something else that comes into question in presenting such cases. I but, think with the, when you bring up the, the actual different perspective of the different witnesses, um, when you look at footage and the video, I don't think the the, the uh, interpretation applies to that. Yeah, you, you've got you know, as far as mental, you know, the different witness interpretations when you're actually looking at the footage. The footage doesn't lie, but I mean, in the case where we want to go back to the actual case of in Ohio and even George Floyd, when we had the video of him putting his neck on his, um, and, and, and you know, the police officer, we watched that, the whole world watched that happen. So the interpretation, I don't think anyone got that wrong. No, um, no. When you're looking at that, there is no different interpretations and witnesses. So that wouldn't no, apply. No, I, I, the first thing I, th I saw when I saw that case, I said, you know, and I'm, and I'm looking at it from a, uh, a criminal defense lawyer standpoint, and I've defended police officers uh, charged with crimes, and I'm and I'm watching him walk walk George Floyd across the street. Well, he's handcuffed, so his hands are behind him. Sure, he's a big guy, but then they put him into the uh, into the back seat of the driver's side of the car, and then the next thing you see, he's out. He comes out the passenger's side of the car. Well, anybody that we know, he didn't open that passenger side door because his handcuffs are, are, hand, uh, are, are handcuffed behind him. And anybody familiar with police cars knows that you can't open the uh, rear passenger door from the inside of the car. So it means a police officer had to open that door and pull him out of the car. And they pulled him out of the car and now he's on the passenger side of the car. <clears throat> and that's when they're really, uh, that's when the, uh, the tragedy occurs. So uh, there was no resisting by Floyd. This wasn't Floyd's fault. There was no way he could, I mean, that he was doing anything other than 
being pulled and tugged and eventually strangled. Okay, um, David, is there something you'd like to? Yeah, I had a question going back a little bit about how you said you don't believe in defunding the police because we need police. So my understanding of the phrase defunding the police does not necessarily even frequently mean getting rid of police. It just means reallocating some of the funds to mental health, uh, maybe setting up a different type of uh, force like um, made up of uh, mental health workers that can deal with certain situations that cops would tend to draw their arms on or in because they don't know what else to do. For example, the, uh, the autistic teenager in Utah this past summer, the mother of which called the cops because she couldn't handle him for whatever reason. He's autistic and he's a young, a young boy. Two cops show up, they shot and killed him, um, you know, because they don't know what else to do. They're not trained to like, you know, calm him down. They're trained to com commandeer a situation even to the point of deadly force. It's because a lot of what happens nowadays is not, I mean, it's the cop's fault because they're a moral agent and they're responsible for the behavior, regardless of the law. And we'll get to that again later. Um, but I mean, their training that they are given is that you think the worst case scenario going into any situation, that's why you, a lot of times you see cops with their guns on their hands for, you know, somebody who blew off a stop sign. You are, so they're, they are trained to think that that is the worst possible scenario waiting for them in that car even though it's something like one out of every like 15,000 cars actually have a, on the road actually have a gun in it. It might even be like 20,000. It's extremely unlikely that any cop is going to ever could pull over somebody with a gun in the car. The actual reasoning behind uh, the actual rationale of the situation is completely lost on cops training. You don't, you know, you don't, you don't go into any situation thinking the worst possible scenario. That's just not even rational. It doesn't even make sense. Um, so anyway, going, uh, going back to the defunding thing, Don, what do you think about that? It's, it's not getting rid of cops, but reallocating funds and so on. I, I definitely uh, think there should be a reallocation uh, of okay. some funds because the police are called, and parents uh, do this all the time, they, their child's strung out in drugs or he's, he's got a mental uh, 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 handicap or something and he's acting up. And the next thing you know, the cops are there, and they're not trained. They're they're not trained social workers. They're not trained to uh, uh, deal with these things, and so it escalates. Generally, well, uh, you know, it generally escalates into some type of resisting, and then the, the uh, person's taken off to jail, and and uh, and then the parents are saying, "But I only called you to help me." Well, the problem is. <laughs> they're not skilled in, in, in helping and uh, they're that's how they help that's yeah, what they that's do how we help you know it, it'd be like <laughs> you know the, the bottom line is we're there to enforce the law somebody enforces the law and unless you got <clears throat> um, some seasoned veteran or something that's uh, uh, that's that's dealt with this before the next thing you know the, the person's off in jail and they're not getting the uh, uh, they're not getting the help they need and, and I think one of the biggest problems that the police have to deal with is, is the homeless problem. And then they have to arrest these, they end up arresting these people. And, um, and then what do you do? They throw them in jail. Well, you know what it costs per day to lock somebody up? I mean, it, it costs a lot of money. I, I, it was a few years ago, I was over in Clearwater uh, for a, uh, a law school event and, uh, they had a new courthouse and behind it, there was this, uh, it looked like a, 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 a hotel, motel. And I said, but it, you know, it didn't have, and I said, what is that? And they said, well, the sheriff convinced the county to buy a hotel. And uh, when we have a homeless person, we, if we were gonna arrest them, we don't take them to jail. We take them to this hotel because it's got minimal security and, and they have the people stay there, you know, while they sort through their, uh, their, their legal problems. And I thought, what a great idea you know, to, to have a low cost place where they can take the people to and they're not in the, in the, uh, in the regular jail. So uh, defunding can, if, if defunding means reallocation of funds, then uh, yes, I think that's a, a, a very good idea. And particularly uh, 
and, 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 and police don't like, they don't like going to these domestic violence uh, uh, calls. Those are the most dangerous calls going on. And then what happens? It, 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 we, have a, we have a joke here in, in, uh, in South Florida in the domestic violence court because uh, the guy or the, or the woman will get arrested and then by the time the court date comes, they're back together. Hold on, <laughs> come into court, you know, and, and so you've wasted all this manpower and, uh, and you're, you're, you're criminalizing somebody when they, when they probably need some good marital counseling or good relationship counseling. Right. Anna, did you want That's to- That's true. That is true. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I like to uh, say the phrase of reimagine the police. Okay. Um, and then that way we can bring in mental health. We can lighten up the load of the um, of the officers where they're not just getting everything that society doesn't want to deal with and just throw it in their court with a 21 week training. Um, but I did want to ask you a question, Don. Um, I do like the culture that uh, your area has created where they don't even see, they don't even touch a case unless there's some kind of uh, uh, video. Um, I think that's really important because it levels the playing field with he said, she said, and or criminal versus cop. And they're always going to pick the cops word. Exactly. So it levels, I think it levels that playing field where it at least is true, even if it's the most true you know, which is what we want. We want the most truth out there. Right. Um, so I think that's great. How do you, how is the culture with prosecutors and cops? Because it came up in a discussion where prosecutors and cops, they need to work together on items. But right. then if a prosecutor receives a case where there's an allegation against that officer, how does that play out? And how does it play out in your area? Um. We've got, uh, actually, it's going to be interesting because we have just elected uh, for the first time in over 40 years, we have a new new chief prosecutor, the uh, uh, prosecutor that, that has been there since 1976. Can you believe that? That's a long time. He didn't seek reelection. And so we have a, uh, a new young prosecutor that takes office January 1st. And it's going to be interesting to see uh, how that changes. He's, uh, uh, he's a young, uh, young black man. And it's the first time we've had a uh, black, here we don't call them district attorneys, we call them state attorneys. It's the first time that we've had a, uh, a black uh, chief state attorney ever in the county. And it's the first time we've had uh, some new blood in the office. So it's going to be interesting uh, to see how he approaches that, that problem. Uh, I think the, uh, when there's an allegation against the police, I think that you need a, uh, a separate uh, prosecute, prosecutorial unit to handle those cases. And that unit shouldn't be, for lack of a better word, buddy-buddy with the police. And uh, if you have that kind of uh, uh, demarcation or difference, I think you can... Uh, uh, make a difference, you know, it'll make a difference because now they're looking at the, uh, at the officer as a, another potential defendant. And, you know, when you realize that uh, it's always tough, it's always tough to prosecute a police officer. I, I used, I started my career as a prosecutor and I prosecuted a police officer for uh, tampering with evidence. And it wasn't a good result. Uh, he had planted evidence on two defense, on two, uh, there was three people. He planted evidence on the, on two of the three and because he wanted to make a drug bust. And, uh, and unfortunately these guys had, and these were all white defendants. There was no issue of race in, in the, in the process. And the bottom line is, Two of those defendants were actually in prison when uh, when the, the, the detective's partner came forward and you know said, "Look, this guy Gary Beck, he set these guys up." 
but what did you have? I had one officer's word against another officer's word. Uh, the uh, the judge that had put the two uh, put the two gentlemen in prison because they had bad records. He he immediately released them, but that was you know that's you know they'd been in jail for a year or two, and uh, but the bottom line is I had a sergeant that was on trial, and I had a uh, um, another detective who's saying he did X, and unfortunately back then that was in the uh, in the early 70s uh, by, the, uh, by the jury well, well cops don't do anything wrong and uh, he was acquitted he walked by me at the after the jury found him not guilty and he goes he looks at me and he and, and he says to me uh, I'll be back on the road tonight why don't you drive through the city of North Lauderdale I can tell you, I never went through the, through the city of North Lauderdale again as long as he was on uh, on duty, because who knows what he would do. But that, you know, that's the problem you have with with uh, prosecuting uh, police officers. Um, David, if you don't mind, real quick, that's a very interesting story. Sorry, I'm trying to get better lighting here. Um, and I know a lot of lawyers in my area. And when I lived in Portland, I was really good friends with a group of lawyers. Um, and I've heard similar stories of, I'm sorry, I've heard stories of basically the going from this notion in America where, you know, cops are by definition things that don't do anything wrong to, all right, we want like hard, we want video, we want audio, we want hard evidence because cops lie. Okay, <laughs> you know. Um, and I've heard talked to plenty of defender defending uh, attorneys, defendant, defender attorneys, um, who say they've they've seen cops lie flat out, boldly, right on the stand. Um, and a lot of it has to do with this. And which so basically, I'm really shocked and impressed to hear that a cop turned on another cop in that case, in your case, because cops seem to have this like gang like loyalty to one another, well above and beyond their loyalty to the citizens they're sworn to protect and serve. Um, so they'll plant evidence, they'll lie, they'll, they'll coerce um, testimonies, you know, in, a, in large part sometimes to, to protect their fellow officers, um, which of course isn't right. The only thing that should matter in all these cases is the truth, not, you know, that's it. Um, so like, so what do you think of qualified immunity, getting to the bones of all of that, of like how difficult it is to keep cops accountable for their actions has in large part to do with this federal notion of qualified immunity. Well, we have uh, we have in Florida uh, qualified immunity also. And, Is it a state uh, thing or a federal thing? Well, it, it can be both. Okay. And in in, uh, in in regards to state officers, you have uh, <clears throat> qualified immunity, and then you also have a cap on how much you can uh, uh, if you sue a police officer. You've got a cap on how much you can uh, get, get from the uh, municipality. So you, uh, it used to be a uh, hundred thousand dollars. Well, it, it sounds like a lot, but uh, it, it's it's really not when you you figure what the lawyer's going to have to do to uh, you know put money into developing the case. Because let's face it, most of the people that get uh, that you're going to be representing don't have the financial means to pay the lawyer on an hourly basis. So the lawyer's got to take it on a contingent fee basis. And so that, uh, that deters people from uh, 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 pursuing those cases because the bottom line is what, you can get $100,000 and uh, uh, that's if you hit a home run. And you, you know, so it's, uh, I think the uh, immunity needs the the cap needs to be raised. It, let's face it, it's inflation. We need to raise the cap. Uh, and if you raise the cap, then you'll see that these, uh, uh, maybe these lawyers will take the case and, and pursue it. But it's just like they do the, the right, they raise the cap on MedMal. And so, uh, because it's a, it's a sign of the times, 
inflation. So raise the cap on these things and uh, and uh, because when I say raise the cap, the the cap applies to the city. Because I mean, let's face it, that's who has the city or the county. That's who has the deep pocket, not the individual police officers. So, which means we end the taxpayers end up paying for it twice. Yes, we typically pay for their training and their salary and all the equipment, and then we have to pay for every time they do something stupid. Exactly, and, and in fact, and these goes into tens to hundreds of millions of dollars, depending on the city per year, as far as uh, 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 trials against cops, complaints against cops. It's just it's audacious. It's ridiculous. But it so, is, in, uh, and you you have to. I th the key is hiring in the first place. You've got, so do, you've got to do a better job of sorting sorting out who you're gonna uh, hire. That's interesting. So, so you feel like there should be more scrutiny scrutiny in the hiring process? Do you think a possible psychological testing is something that should be looked into? Or the other thing I also wanted to raise was there there's a level of um, ex military that is often recruited. Well, yeah, because what happens is I'll, tell you, I'll address your uh, uh, your point on each by point. There is a psychological aspect uh, in the hiring process, and yes, a lot of former military are hired because on the at least on the the scale down here in the, in the South Florida areas, they get X number of points toward hiring if they've got military experience. So they may all jump somebody else that doesn't have uh, uh, military experience because they've, they've got points added to their score because of military experience. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a prime example of what bad hiring can do. And this takes this takes us back a few years. Back in, uh, in the early 80s uh, in, in Miami, they had what was called the Mariel boat lift. And so you had this large influx of uh, Cubans fleeing Cuba and as a result the city of Miami had to uh, uh, overnight increase its police force which meant uh, to deal with it, with all the problems to dealing with it and so what happened was they increased their police force but they could they had to take shortcuts in the hiring process and there was not proper screening and then what ha what happened by the 90s, and Candace can maybe remember this, then there was the big case of the Miami River cops. There was a whole bunch of police officers on the city of Miami police force that had been hired uh, during this onslaught, not proper screening. And they had, and in fact, within the police force formed a criminal gang and they were involved in drug smuggling, killing drug smugglers and everything else. And, uh, uh, and, and they were finally in a process, you know, uh, sorted out and prosecuted, but it was all the result of poor screening. So screening wow. is, a, uh, it is key to, uh, to getting qualified people. Well, that's an interesting point too, as far as the screening part goes, because I've heard people advocate for less if not or, or no veteran military veterans allowed on police forces because the police force cannot should not be like a military organization they are not soldiers in a war zone or a battle zone this isn't a war-torn country they're dealing with their own people very very different situation and we don't want people who are already trained killers to be on the street policing us um but i couldn't imagine a police force not wanting a, a former an ex military person on there with all their training already um so that that that's interesting to see what's going to happen there but um do you do you think that well, how do I say this do you think I want to go back to the systemic racism thing do you think that there's a notion of do you think that systemic racism amongst policing in this country can be done away with by legislation no i i I, I don't I don't know how you legislate a problem away. Uh, you know, I, I, I assume there's, there's some legislation that would help, but I just don't know how you legislate a change in attitude. You know, we can pass all the laws we want. We have to uh, uh, 
we have to change the culture, really. Right. And we have to um, change just people's attitudes about w the way they deal with other people. Right. And if you change that, then you've gone a, a long way toward changing uh, attitudes. You know, it's, it's, it's like a young prosecutor and, and the police versus uh, somebody like myself. I've been practicing for 47 years. My approach, I get along with the police very well. They know I don't take any nonsense from them, but uh, I teach at the police academy on occasion. And, uh, and I tell them, look, you lie and I'm gonna catch you. So just tell the truth and let it, let the chips fall where they may. I mean, you don't yeah. want me embarrassing you on the stand. So, uh, and I think, and another thing about reform that could be easily done in uh, places, Florida is one of the only states in the United States where we allow depositions in criminal cases. What so, does that mean? By that, you know, like in a civil case, like an auto accident case or anything else like that, the other side gets to call you in and take your deposition and find out all about the accident. Well, in, in Florida, every, in any felony case, we have the right to subpoena the police officers in and question them under oath with a court reporter and with the, with the prosecutor there about the case and we don't have we're not stuck with their one-sided view in a police uh, report and so but and we know what our client's version is and so we can we can start questioning them about the case about the evidence and at the end of the day yeah it 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 takes time and it takes money but at the end of the day, we know the prosecutor will sit there sometimes and go, uh-oh, I didn't realize this was going on or I didn't realize that was going on. Or by the, by the same token, we can go back and tell our clients, this is what the case, this is what they have. They've got you. They don't have you. And it helps, it helps move the, uh, the system along. But depositions where you can bring people in, question them under oath, is... is is it gets to the truth faster and without the uh, without having the, a, a jury trial and then you, you can uh, you can I, I think it goes a long way and the cops know that they, that you're bringing them in and they know you're going to be questioning them and uh, uh, I think it, it, it helps them eventually tell the truth the complete truth yeah, I think that's very important, Don. Um, going back on just vetting whoever you're going to hire. There needs to be a vetting uh, probationary period. And um, I think there should be a lot of mental health screenings and psychological screenings um, to see if people can get along and, and, and put them in situations where they have to be. It's diverse. And then you, you, you know, you spend time with them and then you, you figure out what their true character is. Right. And then you go from there. Um, so, I mean, because that's, as far as the police is concerned, I mean, they're here to protect and serve and obey the law. And um, so they should be uh, vetted the most. So I'm <laughs> glad that you are here. Um, David, I hope this has answered your questions. Aaliyah, I hope this has answered, you know, any of your questions or concerns or thoughts. Anna, yours as well. Um, thank you. This is a very serious talk amongst um, us. You're our first guest. And um, we really appreciate you being here. David, is there anything else you want to see, say? I saw you looking up to the sky like you wanted to say something. I'm trying to figure out lighting in this room. Or you won't hold yes, I do. Or be respectful. <laughs> so go ahead. And what's happening? Handed. Oh, sorry. Go. What's what's happening? Okay. Anyway, um, speak. 
Speak, okay. So <laughs> I just, I just um, wanted to talk about the militarization of the police. I, I even in my campaign trails, I, I'd heard from an elderly gentleman about barber shops and uh, how he noticed uh, a lot of police attending a specific, you know, shop, and they get those military haircut styles in the police. And he just noticed that there was a, a lot of disrespect with. Uh, citizens and in, in general because of the um, I, I've seen that uh, uh, I think else I, I'm going to talk about no I think the uh, the, the militarization um, uh, of the police uh, I think it depends on the uh, on the agency it really does. I think it goes because you have some agencies where they, uh, like like here, uh, we used to always joke that the Hollywood Police Department, City of Hollywood Police Department, in, in years past, we, we wondered like what gym do they go hire these guys from? They're all muscle bound. They all got the the, the, the close cropped hair. And they and they on, on their road patrol, and they look like uh, you know, holy. You, you mean you could pick out? What happened? It was the culture? Yeah. So I think it goes from uh, from department to department as to what. Uh, uh, as to you know these this this militarization but uh, i thought when i saw that question um a lot of these departments too have uh, they're they're acting like they're a, a pseudo paramilitary organization they buy these uh, uh, uh armored carriers and all this stuff and you think what the heck i mean uh, uh are we really, do we really need this stuff? But they, they the federal government makes it available to them at, uh, I guess, some rock bottom price or gets, uh, grants it to them. So, uh, you know, they, they grab up all this stuff. And so they, they end up being a military, paramilitary organization. They've got armored car carriers and, and things like that, which, uh, uh, They've got a, a, I know one police department here locally, he's got this thing, they call it the tank and they drive around in it, you know, and it's like, are you kidding me? We, we don't need that. Yeah. yeah. So what's the, what's the future, your future, the future that you see of policing in America? In closing, we have to wrap this up. This has been very foretelling and, and very good, very informative. I hope, I hope uh, all this, this I, th I think the biggest thing too has been uh, cameras. Everybody's got a uh, cell phone camera. And I think that's bringing attention to, uh, to the problem. And I, I think that the, uh, the wise police administrators are gonna say, look, you don't know who, who's gonna have a camera on out there. And if we keep having problems with you, uh, and these videos show up on TikTok and all these different uh, sources, uh, media sources, you know, we're just going to have to get rid of you. And I think a lot of it, I think a lot of it too is the problem is uh, there is a probationary period, but then once they uh, in the uh, community in the communities and the cities that have a union. Once you get them in the union, it's tough to get them out. And uh, I think there needs to be some reform in that area because uh, uh, once they're, uh, uh, it's just like school teachers too. You can't get rid of the incompetent school teachers because they're a member of the union. You can't get rid of the uh, incompetent police because it's too hard because they're a member of the union. Now, I'm not a union buster but the bottom line is you need to, there has to be some reform uh, to allow for these uh, uh, for the 
the, the rotten eggs, and there's only a few. There's a few rotten eggs, but the few rotten eggs get all the attention. So there's got to be some kind of reform to, uh, uh, in, in terms of a collective bargaining agreement to be able to get rid of the, uh, get rid of them. And I think that would, uh, look, that would prove, bode well for the future of policing too, is, uh, if you can, uh, make it easier to sever relations with the, uh, with the bad cops. Oh. David, Aaliyah, is there anything else you want to say in closing? I just want to elaborate a bit more on this 1033 program. If you're able to inform us a bit more about that, do you know anything about that? What uh, what is exactly the 1033 program? I don't recognize it by a number. Uh, it's 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 pretty much a, you've sort of touched on it in terms of it's it, it's it's looking at some of the weapons that are utilized in the police force that are actually military grade. And, and whether or not that is something that would alarm you in dealing with cases that come before the court. Why are we using such grade level weapons when dealing with civilians? Well, you know, it, it went, it's funny how the pendulum sw swings. Uh, there was a case here in, uh, in uh, when the police used to use 38s and the bad guys had the, uh, had the uh, the heavy armored guns and there was a case here in uh, in South Florida some years ago and it was the uh, worst day in the history of the FBI it was a, a shootout and uh, the bottom line is a carload of FBI agents was surveilling a, a, a group involved in robberies and, a, and in fact a friend of mine was an FBI agent that was involved in that and uh, uh, the FBI at that point in time only allowed their agents to have a, uh, a standard issue 38 caliber revolver with six shots and they got into a shootout. And, uh, it, and my friend was almost uh, killed. He was on the ground shot. And when one of the other agents uh, shot the, one of the defendants that was over him. But so from that time on, now the FBI armed up, started using Glock pistols and, uh, and, having a special response team. And then, you know, the local police department started uh, using Glock semi-automatic weapons. And then the next thing you know, they're advancing from the, uh, from the uh, Glock uh, to certain members of the police department are, car are carrying AR-15s and everything. And I think, and, and, uh, and let, me, let me put it this way, I'm not, a, I'm not totally against guns. I've got a number of guns myself, but I do think that they, they've got to do something about uh, assault rifles. They've got to do something about outlawing assault rifles. Nobody needs an assault rifle. I mean, you can have a handgun for protection or whatever, but you do not need an assault rifle. And because of, of assault rifles, the police have assault rifles, the bad guys have assault rifles, and then that scares the general populace to death when they see a police officer in his armored vest with a uh, with an assault rifle. I mean, they, you know, are we under siege? And uh, uh, I think it would go a long way. Uh, I know it's not a popular issue in the United States. Uh, I believe in the Second Amendment, but I think it, 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 there should be limitations on the Second Amendment. So we don't need to see cops walking around with AR-15s. And... Yeah, I went to a Cubs game last, not this summer, the summer before, and just a swath of cops with like you know machine guns on their on their on their chest. I'm like, oh my god, it's so just, it's just disgusting. You know, I mean, I'm trying to go to a baseball game and I feel like I'm in a military state. Yeah. You know? <laughs> anyway. Well, uh, the Paris subways are uh, are that way right now. Oh no! I I went to, I flew into Rome once, and yeah, soldiers sitting up there on the balconies with Uzis. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a, very disconcerting. It's the state of things. It's very upsetting. 
Yeah, no, I wonder if, uh, you know, one last thing is just, you know, as a general point, I wonder if, you know, our society, there's two reasons why we have cops. Either A, we need them, which means that there's something wrong with the way that we're treating each other, or B, we don't and we're mistaken about that fact. Um, either way, it's bad. Um, cops are always a consequence of something is wrong, either our reasoning or our behavior, okay? Um, so I think that to try to get society, like you said before, I mean, legislation isn't going it, to, it, it'll give you, you know, cause to bring people to court to sort out your, your differences and, and abuses towards each other. You got to change people's minds and people's hearts. You got to make, make it so that people don't want to hurt other people. Right. And we're true. all born, you know, your token sociopath aside, we're all born with a moral compass. It's called conscience. Okay, we all have access to what is right and what is wrong. That's what human reason is for. There's ethics and philosophy. Philosophers have been dealing with these issues for thousands of years. There's all sorts of rational arguments, systems, methods by which you can come to rational conclusions concerning how you should treat other people. Um, all the information, you know, you just said critical thinking is a big part of this. I know Ed was here. He'd be speaking in my favor on this as well. Um, it's just... You know, cops, again, cops are just a sign that something is wrong. So to have more of them, I don't think is the answer. When we start seeing a, a responsible diminishing of the amount of police in this country without a rise in crime and crap like that, something's going the right way. That's my final word. I have one more thing to say. Um, you have a lot of, you have a wealth of experience. You've been um, an attorney for a long time. Um, you're in an area that has body cameras and that doesn't even touch the case unless there's a evidence, um, video evidence. Do you think in your area it's reached a perfect, perfect system where it's efficient justice? Or is there something else that you would like to see to make it more efficient? Uh, I think we're, in, we're headed in the right direction. And uh, I, I hope that... Uh, uh, with our new uh, state attorney in place that uh, will continue in the right direction. Uh, uh, I think that the, uh, I think that we're, we're making progress. Unfortunately with the, uh, uh, there was an incident uh, with the Black Lives Matter March here in Fort Lauderdale where the city of Fort Lauderdale kind of lost it and uh, we're dealing with the repercussions of that. We're uh, in the process of picking a, a new police chief as a result of that. And, uh, and hopefully that decision is gonna be made after the first of the year. I was looking at the different candidates and uh, I'm hoping that they'll, uh, uh, that that'll make some meaningful change within that department because that is one of, besides the Briar County Sheriff's Office, uh, the city of Fort Lauderdale Police Department is the second largest police department in the uh, in, in in our county, Broward County. So uh, I think we're we're headed in the right direction, with a cautious eye, I should say. Do Do you feel that multiculturalism or, or having a greater a diverse ethnicity within the police force would make a difference? Has it made a difference? Do you, do you feel that in your experience and handling of cases that um, what different people bring as backgrounds could make be friends? Oh, we've got, without a doubt, we've got to get rid of the, of the white male police department, the, the totally white male police department. That's, we've got, look, in, in Briar County alone, we've got a large Haitian population, a hard, large Jamaican population, a large Brazilian population, We've got a large uh, Russian population. So we need, we need police officers from all those different uh, cultures to, uh, uh, the people from those different cultures to be police officers. Because the police, we need the police department to reflect the, uh, the community itself. We can't have, it can't be the old days of uh, it's all Irish cops uh, in New York City or someplace, or it's all, you know, we need uh, different faces and we need women. And uh, we need men and women. And I think uh, I see it in, in our, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, 
at least here locally, the departments are diversifying and uh, uh, getting uh, uh, a real mix of uh, cultural backgrounds, which is good. I think the, uh, well, the Hallandale Police Department, uh, I don't know if he still is, but the Hallandale Police Department had a, uh, a Haitian police chief. So, I mean, that there's a step in the right direction. You know, you've got, uh, uh, and, you, you know, and with the large Hispanic population here, we've got uh, uh, Hispanic uh, police officers. And in Broward County now, surprisingly, with this, with, uh, with this last uh, election, just this past November, for the first time in the history, and, and you remember, Brown County is the second largest in terms of population in the state of Florida. We've got a black state attorney. We've got a black elected public defender. We've got a black elected sheriff. We've got a black uh, elected supervisor of elections. And we've got a black um, uh, clerk of court. First time ever. And that's the, that's the, that is the, um, uh, you've got black leadership at the top of all the uh, key offices uh, dealing with the criminal justice system. So I think we're uh, I think we're going to be headed in the right direction. Okay. Well, closing. Um, Aaliyah will be back on her uh, shortly. Uh, but in closing, fo to recap what you said tonight is one, to defund, not to defund the police, but to reform it by uh, vetting, putting more funds into training, psychological test, mental test. Um, their training as far as um, their military, their weapons, take away rifles, shotguns, uh, some, the, uh, the shotguns, and um, also um, diversify the community, um, which so it can reflect, you know, uh, different cultures, um, which it would be healthy for us to all get along. Um, so, I mean, Aaliyah stuff keeps going in and out, but I want to thank you again, Don, for taking the time out to join us and to talk to um, some of the delegates from the Green Party, Anna from Chicago, <laughs> and uh, David, he's also in Chicago. He just joined the Green Party, and um, Aaliyah Sarfrez, well, she'll get back in here. She's a part of the Green Party as well and also ran for District 52 um, this term. And, um, and I joined the Green Party recently, so which is why I'm here, a part of this group. And um, as you know, you know, I've known Don since uh, for almost 15 years, Don, 15? Uh, let's make it 20, Candace. 20 years. <laughs> Can you tell them how we met, right? I met <laughs> Yeah, she, she came to work as a, uh, I was with a law firm in Miami, and she came to work uh, to fill in for a girl while she was on vacation, and uh, she, she started working as a paralegal after that, and we, we struck up a friendship, and it's, we've maintained it, that was year 2000, so uh, yeah, we've maintained it for 20 years. 20 years. Wow. So. You're making me feel old, Candace. So. Me? <laughs> you? <laughs> Hey, we get better with age, and um, I'm just I'm grateful to. And I, you, you all are Green Party. I'm, I'm a rare bird. I'm a Republican for Biden. I had my uh, uh, sign out. Uh, there's, uh, I'm, I'm pro I'm an old style Republican. I, physically conservative, but uh, socially progressive. So I'm. I'm probably going to have to become an independent because there's no uh, there's no place for me in, in Trump's party. Your, your party's in a downward spiral right mm -hmm. now because he has utterly destroyed the Republican Party. I uh, there's nobody that uh, that dislikes Donald Trump more than I do, and now he's the, now he's our neighbor. I live in Boca Raton, so he's going to be Ew. thirty miles up the road, <laughs> and they're making. And he, now he's making noise. He wants him to name the uh, West Palm Beach Airport, make it to, to 
bother making the trunk bigger for that. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop, does it? <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Don. <clears throat> Mother's 90. My mother was 97 in uh, November. And four years ago, she said, I'm going to live long enough to vote Donald Trump out of office. And uh, she made it. Good for That's her. Good. That's good. That's good. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Be safe. And we will so we'll reconvene next Sunday. I'm excited to see what we have. We're going to talk about next. Yeah, these are all these great. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about some fiscal, uh, uh, conservative fiscal policy. Yes. And that's what we want, too. We want some good numbers and make yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't get, if, you, if we don't get a hold of some kind of this spending and these, on uh, all these wars and everything, uh, mm -hmm. it's not going to affect me. But you, kid, you, you guys and your kids are going to be, Paying for this, you're going, to be, you're going to be bankrupt if, if spending doesn't get any under some kind of control. Yeah. And the taxpayers are paying a lot. We have the 1033 program, so we're paying it to the uh, uh, the military companies, the Boeing, the Halliburton, and then we're paying it, they're getting it for free to the low or low cost through the 1033 program. Right. And then we have to pay for all of the litigation and all of the stuff that comes along with it. And I'm a taxpayer and I'm done. I'm tired. <laughs> I want change. I want it now. <laughs> yes. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, we, how do we go from uh, whether you liked Clinton or not, we didn't have a deficit then to uh, and now we've got the biggest deficit in, in the history of the country. You know, and it's just... And it seems to just get keep getting larger and larger and larger. So no representation. So almost seventy percent, sixty seven percent wants Medicare for all. Where is it? Yeah. Well, Where's our representation? But the uh, we do need uh, with this with this present pandemic, uh, we do need uh, just all, all these loans to these businesses and everything. We need the aid going directly to the people at this point in time. I mean, the, I just, I just represent, I'm representing a, a doctor. He's charged with, uh, with, with fraud over, uh, he got one of those small business loans, but he spent it on not the business. You no, know, that's what these people are. That's what people are doing. I mean, it, I, I would, if Biden would appoint me, I would work for free for a year just to go after these people that had abused that first, uh, those first loans, because that's, that's just stealing. And, uh, you know, I, and I'm at a point in my life where I, you know, I, I don't, uh, necessarily have to work, but I would volunteer to prosecute these people because that's just downright stealing. I had a guy here, for instance, he, he got two point two point something million dollars, just totally fraudulent. Went out and bought a Ferrari and all this stuff, and he said he had a business with fifty eight people. He had the business with nobody. I mean, what, but there was no scrutiny because the bank get in a hurry without that money. <laughs> You know, and, and you think about it, the banks, the banks were making, a, you know, a fee off of it. So is it easier to prosecute, if, if you think about it, is it easier to fill out a loan application or do the due diligence or supposed due diligence on a $10 million or twenty ten thousand $10,000 application? So of course you just do the big one. And you hand some guy five million or ten million bucks, and uh, you, you go on your way. It's ridiculous. So anyway, off my, I'll get off my soapbox for a while. That's a whole conversation. <laughs> I'm seventy-three, and I'm still fighting. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'll thank die. You. I'll die of going <laughs> complaining. So anyway, anyway, mm -hmm. it, was, it was nice meeting y'all. Nice it. meeting you too. It was nice meeting you. Thank you for joining us tonight and offering such a wonderful experience that you've 
been through. Now we understand from an attorney's perspective. And I think that's, that's part of the understanding that we're trying to build here. We, we need to know what's going on from different lenses. And that is so important to building that collective conscious that becomes America. Hey, if you ever have a, uh, a, any kind of question about uh, uh, any of the, uh, anything that we've talked about or any legal stuff dealing with this type of stuff, criminal law, just feel free to uh, get, get, get my number from Candid. Just feel free to call me. I'm, Thank in, you. I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in day 290 of the lockdown, so uh, with COVID, so no. we've got plenty of time to talk. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't realize we were still counting. <laughs> I started. I started counting because I've been. I was actually. We got one. One more second. I was actually in a first degree murder trial, a death penalty trial, in March. We had pick, spent six months picking a jury. We were supposed to pick the jury the following Monday, when the lockdown started. We had we had narrowed the jury pool down to sixty people, and we were going to pick our twelve plus our alternates from it, and then this, the everything came to a screeching halt so now whenever we start again i guess we got to start all over so yeah that's a whole other issue i mean i know around here uh, the local judges have suspended all the rights to speedy trial right. because, mm -hmm. of a, because of COVID. yeah and my client COVID. COVID in the um, you know i know of people just through through cop friends of mine that are in jail right now for over a year and they haven't been convicted of anything. They're just sitting there waiting for their trial. A year of their life of their liberty has been orderly taken away for them because of this COVID thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's I mean it just breaks my heart that you know I couldn't even imagine, especially if I knew I was innocent of a crime and I had to sit in jail for, for a year just for a trial. Oh man, I don't know. Here are the <laughs> judges that, uh, the judges in the state attorney's office here have been uh, have been very liberal about um, uh, letting uh, felony offenders, if they if they don't have a history of violence or you know and stuff, letting them out of jail on, on their own recognizance, and, uh, and mm -hmm. in some cases just putting an ankle monitor on them and telling them to go home. So, uh, uh, huh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's it's it's been refreshing and uh, uh, to do it to see them doing it, and because um, I've got a client who was on a violation of probation. We were just getting ready to have his hearing, uh, and then COVID hit. So he is, the judge was kind enough to uh, just put him on an ankle monitor and send him home. So he's been on basic house arrest since April. Uh, his probation term has actually expired. So now, so now we're going to have to deal with that. So, but uh, at least they. They tried to do the right thing in many cases here. Was he able to pay his 10% of bail? Didn't have to. See, that's what, that's what I'm hearing here is that like the people who can't, which is a whole nother issue of how ridiculous the judicial system is. You know, if you're poor, you can't afford bail, you're sitting in jail. If you're rich, you can sit at home waiting for your trial. It's ridiculous. But that people, anyway, the people that can't afford the bail are just stuck in jail. I haven't heard anything about it, uh, ankle monitors or anything like that. That's an interesting thing. I'm going to have to ask my cop friend about that. Yeah, here we, uh, they just, uh, <clears throat> just release them on their, uh, on their own recognizance, but with the ankle monitor, and, uh, uh, not, no money changes hands or anything. You just, you go home and, uh, you sit, and you've got limited hours to go shopping and stuff like that, but, uh, it's, it's worked out very well. It's, uh, it's it's an it's an enlightened approach, I guess. You know, when we get kind of a little a little spoiled down here because we got some judges and stuff that that entertain these things, and then you go to these you hear about what's going on in these small or smaller jurisdictions, or even some of the larger jurisdictions that aren't uh, like you say, ten percent bond have to put up that. No. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.